Well, hello again from Campbellsville Baptist Church here at 420 North Central Avenue in Campbellsville, Kentucky. Uh, we uh, have been going through uh, a survey of the New Testament. We've already looked at the Gospel and Acts, and we've begun a study uh, here on uh, Paul's letters. We have been uh, taking Paul's letters here in chronological order rather than canonical order. The last time we met, we went over 2 Thessalonians. And so today we want to look uh, at uh, 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians would be the, the next letter. And uh, before we do, why don't we go ahead and pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for salvation that comes through Jesus Christ. And now as we consider your word, we pray that uh, not only will we learn more about you and know you, the God of the scriptures, but we pray that we might become more like Jesus Christ through what we learn. Lord, we uh, thank you for the privilege that is ours to study the scriptures. And we give you great praise and honor and glory for who you are and what you've done for us in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we want to look at 1 Corinthians uh, today. And this is one of Paul's letters. Uh, the author uh, is Paul. He says that in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 1. He says, Paul, called as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother. So Paul here, he, um, he claims to be the author of this letter, and he is the author of this letter. And he says he's called as an apostle of Jesus Christ. In other words, he's one of these divinely ordained, directly commissioned authoritative representatives of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says he's an apostle through the agency of the will of God. In other words, it's God's will that he was to be an apostle. You also note that he has a fellow by the name of Sosthenes with him. Uh, Sosthenes is uh, a, a brother in Christ, and he is a co-worker there who is uh, with Paul at the time of the writing of the uh, letter of 1 Corinthians. A little bit about Corinth before we uh, go on. Corinth is an ancient city. If you go to Corinth today, you can see the ruins uh, of uh, Corinth. Corinth was built on the Isthmus of Corinth. Uh, an Isthmus is a very narrow uh, piece of land that connects two larger land masses. Uh, for instance, uh, probably the most well-known Isthmus today is the Isthmus of uh, Panama, through which the Panama Canal uh, cuts through. But uh, Corinth was built on the Isthmus of Corinth, and it was located on major land and major sea travel routes. So a lot of people would uh, go through Corinth or, or visit Corinth or pass through Corinth um, because it was located on these major land and sea routes. From the very beginning, Corinth was a very prosperous uh, city and it becomes famous for its luxury um, years ago, there used to be a, a, a commercial on television, and uh, Ricardo Montalban was in the uh, it was in the commercial, and uh, I forget uh, what car it was. Seems like it might have been a Chrysler product, uh, but uh, Ricardo Montalban would advertise the car, and it was a, a luxury type car, and he would say that it had Corinthian leather. Uh, I don't think there's really any such thing as Corinthian leather, but uh, I think the point was this is some luxurious leather that's in this car. And, and so uh, Corinth lent its name uh, to that Corinthian leather, leather rather in that commercial. But uh, Co Corinth was a very prosperous city and it becomes famous for its luxury. But you know what? It also became famous for its immorality. And, uh, for example, the city contained 27 temples. 27 temples, including one that was dedicated to Aphrodite, the goddess Aphrodite. Now, that's her Greek name. Her Roman name is uh, Venus. But uh, 27 temples, including one dedicated to the uh, goddess of love, Aphrodite, 
And this temple had 1,000 priestesses who were prostitutes. So that uh, gives you an idea of how immoral a city Corinth is. There's one commentator, he writes one of the standard commentaries on 1 Corinthians uh, in the New International Commentary of the New Testament series, the volume on 1 Corinthians by a New Testament scholar by the name of Gordon Fee. And Gordon Fee says this, quote, Corinth was at once the New York, Los Angeles, and Las Vegas of the ancient world, unquote. So we can see that uh, that's quite an immoral city. I mean, all these uh, cities that he mentions individually are, are known in the United States as, uh, as uh, being immoral cities, having their share of immorality. But Corinth was all of them at once, according to, to Fee. So they're known for their luxury, but they're also known for their immorality. In 27 BC, Corinth becomes the capital of the Roman province of Achaia, A-C-H-A-I-A, -A -A, uh, the, the capital of the Roman province of Achaia. So that's a little bit about Corinth before we proceed. As far as the church at Corinth, we know that the church at Corinth uh, started in Acts chapter 18. Remember, Paul has left Athens. He ended up in Athens after fleeing Thessalonica. Uh, and he, after fleeing Thessalonica, he goes to Berea. From Berea, he goes to Athens. And after Athens, he goes to Corinth. And we see that in Acts chapter 18 and verses 4 through 7. And the church there uh, at Corinth included both Jews and Gentiles. We see in Acts chapter 18, beginning at verse 1, after these things, he left Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. So Claudius expels the Jews from Rome. And he came to them, that is, Paul came to Priscilla and Aquila, and because he was of the same trade, uh, Paul was a tent maker, as were Priscilla and Aquila. He came to them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them, and they were working, for by trade they were tent makers. And uh, here's uh, Paul with the church. And he was reasoning in the synagogue every Sabbath and trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. Verse 5, But when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia... Paul began devoting himself completely to the Word, solemnly testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. He's the Messiah. He was the Messiah. But when they, that is the Jews, resisted and blasphemed, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own hand, heads. I am clean. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. And then he left there and he went to the house of a man named Titius Justus a worshiper of God whose house was next to the synagogue. Verse 8 tells us that Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all his household. And many of the Corinthians, when they heard, were believing and being baptized. So here we see in verses 4 through 9, as far as the church at uh, Corinth is concerned, that the church included some Jewish converts it includes, included some Gentile converts. So the church included both Jews and Gentiles. The church at Corinth was a divided church. It was a divided church. And the reason we know that is because we can see in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 that there was a, a, a factional spirit that predominated. In other words, a party spirit. Spirit. I don't mean like, hey, let's have a party. No, I, I mean a party spirit as, follows, as far as them following uh, uh, various personalities uh, and the like. Uh, believers were splitting ranks to follow various personalities, to follow various parties. For instance, we see this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verses 12 through uh, 14. There in... Uh, um, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 12 to 14. Uh, let's start at verse 11. Uh, 
Uh, he says, uh, I've been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people. In other words, Chloe's household has told him, told Paul this, that there are quarrels amongst you. Verse 12, now I mean this, that each one of you is saying, I am of Paul, or I uh, am of Apollos. I am of Cephas, and I am of Christ. And then Paul says, has Christ been divided? And the answer to that question, of course, uh, in the original is no. It demands the answer no. Has Christ been divided? No. Paul was not crucified for you, was he? No, he wasn't. Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? No, they weren't. And Paul says, I thank God that I baptized none of you except for Crispus and Gaius, so that no one would say you were baptized in my name. So uh, there is a, a party spirit uh, that has uh, developed here, uh, that has predominated in Corinth. They're following various personalities, uh, preachers, you know, these people I've just uh, named. Uh, you know, we, we're pretty good at that today. You know, we, uh, uh, we tend to follow uh, and have our favorite preachers. And um, you got to be careful there. You don't want to make an idol out of... Uh, you know, out of a preacher, you want to, uh, of course, worship the Lord Jesus Christ above everybody else. But some do follow preachers so devotedly sometimes you wonder if, uh, if they haven't made them an idol of sorts. But the, this is the type of spirit that had predominated uh, in Corinth. It was a divided church. We see a little bit more of this kind of spirit in chapter 3 and verses 5 through 7, where Paul has to say to this church, what then is Apollos? And what is Paul? Paul says, they're servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. Verse 7, chapter 3, so then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God causes the growth. So he sets them straight concerning these various personalities. He said, listen, they've all got their parts. One plants, another waters, one reaps, this sort of thing. It's God, though. It's God who causes the growth. So a party spirit has predominated here in Corinth. Also, uh, there is perhaps a group of enthusiasts who have uh, elevated uh, supernatural you know, gifts, some of the spiritual gifts, especially speaking in tongues. And we see that in chapter, uh, chapter 14 of 1 uh, Corinthians. But they've elevated uh, speaking in tongues and they're abusing the spiritual gift of tongues. They've elevated the gift of tongues to the top of the Christian life. And, and by doing so, they've created an elitist type of group, which tends to look down on, on other believers. And they've taken control of uh, worship services. So there's disagreements in this church as well concerning spiritual gifts. Still others in the church had uh, adopted a libertine lifestyle, in other words, an immoral lifestyle. They've returned to the immorality uh, of their former ways, and they're looking down on members who have certain convictions uh, about uh, uh, food and food laws. Um, so uh, we, uh, we, we have in this church folks who have adopted a libertine lifestyle. Some of these who have adopted a libertine lifestyle were perhaps influenced by some type of, and I'll explain this here in a moment, of a Hellenistic dualism. Um, this Hellenistic dualism would have downplayed one's physical existence uh, so much so, so that uh, physical acts such as sexual immorality were uh, were permissible because the flesh wasn't really uh, in, uh, because the flesh was uh, wasn't really important. It was unimportant. It's one spirit that uh, mattered. Uh, others uh, in the church at Corinth they they react in the opposite direction. They're not libertine so much as they are uh, very ascetic. Uh, you know they they refrain from uh, everything. So uh, you've got a lot of problems in this church, and uh, there's problems with uh, uh, division and following various preachers. There's problems with immorality in the church, for even in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, for instance, there's a man uh, 
who is living with his father's wife that's in the church and uh, the, the Corinthians think they're being very tolerant you know, by, uh, by tolerating him and what he's doing. And Paul has to address that problem. In chapter 6, you've got problems uh, where uh, believers are taking uh, each other to court over petty matters uh, and appearing before uh, pagan judges. And Paul says, listen, you ought to be able to settle these things amongst yourselves. Uh, also, uh, uh, there are problems with spiritual gifts uh, the worship services are disruptive. So Paul has to address all of these. Um, in chapter 7 through 12, Paul addresses uh, some questions that the Corinthians uh, have uh, asked uh, about uh, various uh, topics. And we see uh, that uh, th in these chapters that they... Uh, they have something of the truth, but not everything. For instance, in chapters 7 through 12. And in these chapters, Paul will uh, often include a yes, but type of uh, form. In other words, he's saying to each of these factions, yes, you have something of the truth, but... For instance, at the beginning of chapter 8, at the beginning of chapter 8, uh, we see that Paul acknowledges that food offered to idols here in verses uh, 4 through 6 is not dangerous. Uh, in other words, uh, he goes on to say there's really no such thing as an idol. Uh, then he says, though, in verse 7, but, but not everybody knows this. And uh, in other words, he's referring to other Christians within the church. There really is no such thing as an idol, Paul says, but not everybody knows this. And so for love's sake, uh, we need to, uh, to do the... Uh, to do the right uh, thing. So uh, a lot of problems in this church. Um, I will say this, that 1 Corinthians is a very negative letter, and yet uh, it addresses a number of problems that we find in our churches today um, here uh, in, uh, in, in this, uh, this church. Uh, they, uh, they have a lot of problems. It is interesting, too, that in this letter, the verb to be arrogant uh, occurs six times, and the verb to boast occurs 35 times. So this uh, church has got a, uh, some carnal problems, uh, some, uh, uh, some pride. Uh, sometimes I, I get people who ask me, um, is it possible to be a carnal Christian? Well, yes, up to a point. Paul uh, calls these uh, believers in Corinth uh, carnal, fleshly, in chapter 1. But, uh, and, and, and he also calls them saints, which, uh, so that seems to be a, a contradiction there, but it's not. You can be a carnal Christian, a carnal saint, but you can't stay there. You have to to move beyond that. You have to repent of uh, carnality and uh, grow in the Lord uh, spiritually. This church has a problem with pride. That's evident from the how many times the word uh, uh, boast occurs, 35 times, and they're arrogant. Uh, and uh, in chapter 4, in verses 8 through 13, Paul's got some very powerful statements where uh, when he says uh, what he says in chapter 4 in verses 8 through 13, uh, he's being sarcastic here. You are already filled. You've already become rich. You have become kings without us. And indeed, I wish that you had become kings so that we might also reign with you. For I think that God has exhibited us apostles, last of all, as men condemned to death, because we've become a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you, you are prudent in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are without honor. To this present hour, we are both hungry and thirsty and are poorly clothed, are roughly treated and are homeless, and we toil, working with our own hands. When we're reviled, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure. When we are slandered, we try to conciliate. We have become as the scum of the earth, the scum of the world, the dregs of all things, even until now. Some powerful statements there on the part of Paul. So according to Paul's comments, these believers are boasting about their spirituality as if the final reign of God had already begun.
As far as the date and place of this letter, uh, I would date it um, right around A.D. 55. So Paul writes this letter right around A.D. 55, and he writes it from Ephesus, from Ephesus. So um, it, that's uh, in, important. As far as the occasion, uh, I've already mentioned that uh, Paul's founding visit in Corinth is in Acts chapter 18. That's about A.D. 50 to 52. A couple of years later, while he's in Ephesus, he writes what is called the previous letter. We see that letter in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 uh, as uh, he writes this church about this uh, man who's living with his father's wife. And he talks about the fact that he has written them previously. For instance, in verse 9 of 1 Corinthians chapter 5, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. I did not at all mean with the immoral people of this world or with the covetous and swindlers or with idolaters, for then you would have to go out of the world. So he writes them a previous letter. We don't know what the contents of that letter are contain. Uh, it's, uh, it definitely deals with the problem of sexual immorality within the church at Corinth. And Paul's words in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 suggest that the Corinthians had misunderstood his directives uh, in that previous letter uh, that addressed the sexual immorality there in the church. So uh, uh, this misunderstanding by the Corinthians of that previous letter leads to the writing of 1 Corinthians, Corinthians the, the canonical 1 Corinthians that we all know in, in our uh, Bibles. That's written around A.D. 55. This letter is occasioned by several events. I've already mentioned in chapter 1 in verse 11 that Paul has heard from Chloe's people. Chloe's people and uh, that's a woman's name. So Chloe's household, and she's no doubt a believer, he's heard from Chloe's people that this party spirit has developed in, Corinthian, in Corinth. They're, they're following these various personalities. Paul has also apparently received a letter from the Corinthian church, and he begins to respond to that letter in chapter 7. And he will take up the items in their letter one by one, most of them uh, introduced by the words now about. For instance, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1. There he says, Now about the things about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. So there he will address some questions, answer some questions they have about marriage. Also down in verse 25. It says now about virgins. I have no command of the Lord, but I give an opinion as one who by the mercy of the Lord is trustworthy. So he will address some questions that they have about those who uh, are, are not married and those who are, are virgins. Uh, also in chapter 8 and verse 1, we see that he addresses uh, Christian liberty, particularly uh, meat that has been sacrificed to idols. Uh, for instance, he says, Now about things sacrificed to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. So uh, this is the passage I mentioned earlier that he acknowledges that there's no such thing as an idol, but that nobody, not everybody knows this. And so that uh, being the case, uh, I should, uh, you know, I should, uh, you know, love that person and I should, you know, if I'm causing my brother or sister in Christ to stumble, uh, I should not do that. In the case of eating meat, sacrificed to idols, Paul says basically there's nothing wrong with that because there are no such thing as idols, but not everybody knows this. But if uh, food causes my brother or sister to stumble, I'm never going to eat meat, meat again. Why? So that I'll not cause my brother to stumble. Chapter 12, verse 1, we see that... Um, uh, uh, they have questions concerning spiritual gifts. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be uninformed or unawares. So he will answer questions concerning spiritual gifts. Uh, earlier, I forgot to mention in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, they're having, a, they're having problems as well with uh, their observance of the Lord's Supper. They're not uh, observing it in the right manner. Uh, 
Um, but uh, Paul answers questions in chapter 12 concerning spiritual gifts. In chapter 16 and verse 1 and also in verse 12, he um, will answer questions concerning the collection for the saints. In other words, the, the monetary collection for the poor saints in Jerusalem. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so do you also. And then he says, on the first day of every week, each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper so that no collections be made when I come. So, uh, so he's, he's answering all these questions for the Corinthians. Uh, another problem that I didn't point out is 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, they, they have problems concerning the resurrection. And Paul will answer uh, that, uh, their beliefs concerning that. So Paul writes this letter of 1 Corinthians to um, correct the misunderstandings that uh, occurred in that previous letter. And also we saw well, there's various things that occasion the, um, uh, the, the writing of this uh, letter of 1 Corinthians. Paul's received a letter from the Corinthian church. He's heard from Chloe's people. Most likely 1 Corinthians... Um, not 1 Corinthians, but the letter that Paul has received from Corinth, the one that he's responding to, this letter from Corinth was written as a response to Paul's previous letter. So in other words, Paul's written the previous letter to the Corinthians. The Corinthian church writes back, and they have some questions. That letter, responding to the previous letter, uh, was brought to Paul by a delegation from Corinth. Chapter 16 and verses 15 through 17 mentions three men, Stephanus, this is a great trivia question, Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus. Uh, this Corinthian delegation, they bring the Corinthians' response to the previous letter to Paul um, before he writes 1 Corinthians. This Corinthian delegation of these, uh, these men may have also brought some oral reports about the situation in Corinth. So what is the purpose? What is the purpose of the Corinthian letter? Well, um, uh, there are some things, some further things that uh, occasion it. Paul critiques the division within the Corinthian church and the errant beliefs which led to the split in their midst. He seeks to address these questions raised by the Corinthian church. He instructs the Corinthians to participate in the offering for the Jerusalem church. Uh, the purpose statement is this, though. Paul writes to chide, to chide the Corinthian church into acknowledging the Lord's ownership of them and the implications of that ownership in the different areas of their lives. The key theme of this letter is this. You belong to Christ and not to so-and-so, not to Paul, not to Cephas, not to Apollos. You belong to Christ and not to so-and-so. And so he chides the Corinthian church into acknowledging the Lord's ownership of them and the, the implications of that ownership in the various areas of their lives. We see in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 that indeed we belong to the Lord. In verse 19, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. So that verse there tells me that uh, I've been bought with a price. Of course, that price is Christ's death on the cross on behalf of our sins. This is language of manumission. Manumission from slavery. Christ has purchased us with a price himself. He's bought us out of the bondage of slavery and the bondage of sin and slavery to sin. And because of that, he owns us. He owns us. And we've been bought with a price. And because of that, we should glorify God in our bodies, in our whole being, glorifying God in everything that we do. Well, that's 1 Corinthians. Uh, it's a, like I say, a very negative book, but it's one that uh, is well worth your while. I mean, there are all sorts of things that we could study uh, in this uh, letter, uh, but uh, that's, uh, that's an overview for, for you in, in, uh, you know, in, in half an hour's time. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, our next uh, session will be on 2 Corinthians. I hope that you will join us. Until next time, you take care and God bless. Bye now.